Welcome everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to Facebook Live. It is the 24th of May, year 2023. I'm hoping everyone is having a fantastic Wednesday today. And we are in our Wednesday evening. Let me welcome our uh, live panel today. I see that April has joined. April, I'm sure everybody's familiar with who April is. April is a psychic. Um, she has quite a few modalities of healing. She's done massage therapy, Amadeus healing, and a whole laundry list of, and she offers counseling services as well. So if anybody wants to have a one-on-one -on -one session, April is available for you. Uh, you can always message her on Facebook and set up those sessions. Is that correct, April? You want them to message you on Facebook Messenger? Perfect. Thank you. And then we have Michelle today back with us because she's been off our panel for a little while, took a little break. So thank you, Michelle. Thank you for being here. And then we have Patricia, who is part of a core group of meditators, just like Michelle. So she's here. Good evening, Patricia. We have Rob, who is an author of the book, Stop Thinking, and he's been joining our panel on a regular basis recently as well. Good evening, Rob. And then we have Hugh. Hugh has been joining us regularly in the evenings as well. Thank you, Hugh. So Michelle, did you want to ask your question that you wanted to, since I, I don't know, Kelly and Kelly are not here. Do you want both of them to be here or just ask April? Um, I can just ask April. It's, it's kind of like a follow up. I think we discussed it a couple weeks back. Um, okay. Right. When um, Lakshmi had posted something mm -hmm. about boundaries. Right. And we kind of talked about it a little bit. But I don't think April or Kelly or Kelly were present during that Facebook live. Um, so it was just your April, your kind of your opinion on on safe boundaries, not necessarily because of a physical assault or you feel threatened physically by someone, but you have a relationship or you've had a relationship with someone. And um, due to past incidents or history, um, it's not that you are upset with them in the sense, but you want to limit the relationship and, and how you interact with that person or the frequency with which you interact with that person. And you want to create some boundaries. I And, and so I, still sending love and wanting that person to thrive. So there's no ill will in that sense, right? But you just want to kind of like you've dealt with this personality or this person for years and years and years, and you don't want to kind of have their energy build around you. So you want to create just boundaries as to how much, how often you speak to them or how you interact with that person. Um, and I wanted your perspective on, on that. Unmute myself. Didn't want to unmute for a second. Um, so the exact situation that you described is basically the situation that I have with my own father. I love him. I don't have any bad energy towards him. I don't wish him any ill will. Mm -hmm. I hope that he is successful. He's happy. He's well. Um, but I do limit my contact with him. I, I text him often, say, hey, I love you. Hope you're having a great day. But as far as being around him, um, it's just not the best scenario. The, he, basically, um, to just put it kindly, he's just still very wounded. So, and especially when you start doing this work, you can sense that 
you start to sense that in others or, and, you know, there's certain, there's a certain amount of time where um, that woundedness will start to kind of come out. So I believe in setting those boundaries. I believe that it's on your own discretion based on the history of the relationship. And so I, I do see him. I see him a few times a year. It is limited. The time spans are short. And that's okay. When I'm around him, I am um, I'm practicing namaste. I'm practicing being in my energy, being in my space, that I'm connected to source. So I am looking at him through source eyes i have a phone call coming in <laughs> um let me tell them i'll call them back so when you do that when you are working on yourself and you are well or you're getting well and you're on that journey and then you're able to do as you know, Poonam speaks about this a lot. A lot of us mention this. When you are looking through the eyes of source, you can see past um, whatever flaws or woundedness that you might see. And that's kind of the space that I keep myself in. And by doing that, um, I'm not projecting anything. I'm not expecting anything. And I can see them with love, but I'm also holding my own space. I'm holding my own energy and my energy is being connected with source. So I'm grounded. I'm, I'm okay. When I first started practicing this, it was, it was difficult. So what I would do when I left, I would remind myself that, um, you know, he is just not well, and it's okay that he's not well. And it was not about me. It wasn't had anything to do with me, my worth, where I was on my journey. So there was a lot of self-talk that I had to do in the beginning. So, and this is kind of like the same thing. So my question to you is, is where are you getting hung up? Um, I think this idea that, you know, creating a, like, we're all one, right? But at the same, in, 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 in the being sense, we're all one and we're all connected. And we had this conversation a few weeks ago where it was like, the, you know, when you say the word boundaries, it's like there's separateness, right? You're coming, but but I think you, you know, it's kind of like you're on two levels, right? So this is where my comfort zone is. And, you know, the relationship is a long, you know, one of not few years, right? A long-term relationship and where there may have been much more resentment in the past on my part, right? Um, I've gotten kind of over that. And then, so I come more from a space of, you know, I need to respect my own, um, my own space, uh, my own presence. And so, you know, I want the best for you. And I, I just, um, he takes conversations to a place where I just don't feel comfortable with anymore. So, um, you know, past trauma or past incidences, and I don't want to deal, deal with the past anymore. And he brings it up all the time. So, it's kind of like just want to create some some space in between in the relationship and but i i do wish him love and i do wish him a lot of peace and and you know success in relationships and you know so are you it almost are you not wanting to hurt their feelings is that no um by by setting the boundary no i guess maybe i was questioning whether you can still be in presence right and 
create those boundaries oh right? yeah, like, yeah 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 is it contradicting or is it no. hand in hand i guess that's where it was coming from it's hand in hand i can be present with and and i really truly love my dad and i have a lot of honor and respect for my my dad he did raise me and my brother he is a vietnam vet um, he has worked very hard his whole life I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. Um, but like you're saying, those little kind of actions or conversations is where that being wounded kind of seeps in. And But I can be in presence. I can be connected to source and hold my space and still be able to set that boundary. I still can express love. Like I said, I will text him often um, and just let him know, hey, thinking of you, hope you're having a great day. So you can absolutely combine the two. That was my feeling, but, and I even think Eckhart in a, a talk that I just heard him on a podcast mentioned that, you know, there is, there is a space for boundaries when needed. So I, I, and I don't, I, in my gut, it's not contradictory. So I just kind of wanted to. Yeah. I mean, if we did it in a, you know, probably the old way before we started this journey, yeah. it may be, but now you can absolutely hold space and, and set that boundary at the same time. Thank you. <laughs> the uh, difference that I see, th thank you, April. You're incredibly amazing as always. So grateful. The difference that I see in the way April described her state and the way you described your state, um, Michelle, right? April is still connected to her dad. Like when setting, it's not so much, I wouldn't even call uh, what April is doing is setting a boundary. I would just say that, um, it's something that you know that um, that person has their condition patterns, right? That person is not living their unconditioned self. They have their condition patterns and the condition patterns come out when we meet. So that means it's not, it's not aligned with how we want to be, right? Like we, we want to be in presence. We want to be with people that are in a state of presence. So, I mean, that will happen with friends. You're going to reduce the amount of interactions with friends that are not going to be as conscious as you, right? But what I heard you say is that your, your um, I didn't hear April say that her um, being gets affected. What you're saying is your being gets affected when that person starts speaking or that person starts interacting. So that is where the separation is. That means the ego is coming in. We have to become, we have to get to that level of uh, spiritual death that no matter how unconscious a person is in our space, right? It could be the most, it could be a serial killer right in front of us. You know, uh, Kimming had this uh, thing that um, Eckhart um, uh, and her lived in an apartment, in an apartment that they had to uh, drive the car through the garage and then the garage door had to come down. You had to close the garage door and not allow any other car behind. And what Eckhart did was when he drove into that um, parking lot, he, he drove in and he let the car behind him in. So when he parked his car, the other driver came parked next to him and started yelling and screaming at Eckhart for allowing him in. And Kim said, he, Eckhart just looked at that person and smiled and it's like, no, no reaction. And this person is like yelling and screaming profanity and uh, you know really acting out their rage. So that's the connection. Like, however unconscious the other person can be, right? Like uh, April's, that's what April is saying when she says I'm connected to source. 
that let him be his wounded self. She has the compassion that he he's a Vietnam vet. He's got his PTSD. He's acting out his PTSD. He hasn't probably done anything about taking care, care of his post-traumatic trauma, right? That, that disorder. So he's going to act that way. So that's the difference that when I when we when we say that we are withdrawing from somebody, that's not so much as a boundary setting. It's more like normally you would withdraw from, you would start to hang out with people that are more spiritual, that are more, uh, have more presence, right? Than people that, and these may be withdrawing from family members. And I'll give you the example. I don't think Eckhart, and I've told you that before, right? Eckhart did not live with his mother. He, she said, uh, uh, he said that she talked incessantly so he could only handle her in small doses. So he would go live with her for two or three days and then come back, uh, kind of. The same, um, in that same video, um, that podcast, Eckhart talks about his father, that how much resentment did he have for his father? But finally, he understood how, you know, that level of compassion, that you understand their unconsciousness, why, why were they unconscious? He understands that his father, was like the eighth child out of uh, seven women, children. He was the youngest, but or eldest, or I don't know what it was. But he was made as a boy, as a 15-year-old boy, his father was made to go out and work when the parents split up. And the girls were allowed to go to private school. So he had a terrible resentment towards women, became a womanizer, never treated his mom, Eckhart's mom properly. They were always violent battles, right? That's where his trauma comes from, Eckhart's trauma. But he had resentment for him. But look at now that he understands that compassion for his father. And towards the end, he saw that his father was beginning to develop some presence, some enlightened this thing. So I'll let you speak to it. Go ahead, thank you. Um. Yeah, I have had similar situations. My dad passed away in 2016 and there were decisions he made that I found out and it was initial resentment, right? And then I'm able to backtrack and say, okay, I understand why he made those decisions and I send him love and that's all I have for him, right? And my mom too, like she's still living and things that she's done and um and expectations that I had of her and that I've let go. So I've worked through a lot of that stuff, but there is a space just like Eckhart did with his stepmom who has schizophrenia. And he says, I can only be with her for short periods of time. <laughs> and then I have to go. I have to go because he's protecting his presence power. And that's kind of how I feel with this other person is that, um, there's no past trauma like, you know, war or anything like that or generational influences. But regardless, because people have their own emotional tendencies or their own psychological conditions that might contribute to having difficulty in relationships and communicating. But, but And so I, even though I still feel like I can send that person love and understand and offer compassion, but it doesn't mean that I have to be responsive um, in terms of communicating at all times. You know, I limit the communication just because I don't want to get pulled into drama, right? I just I feel like I have a lot on my plate as it is that I don't want to add more that's going to require more energy in that state because so I kind of like, protect my presence, you know, my state of mind and state of being, because that can get easily drawn. And, you know, it's, it's one of those relationships that are not, you know, it's familial relationship. It's a family relationship. So, you know, spend a week with your family and I'll see how, you know, conscious you are kind of thing. Right. So I just kind of like, I'm more respectful of my needs versus the other person's needs. Whereas before I may not have been that way. So I'm holding more my own space. 
but uh, can you get to the point that you can hold space while they're saying whatever they're saying? Hold space, hold your person. Like April is talking about it, right? That she is connected to a source while her father is there. So can you- can I can you do it? increments. If I am exposed to that person for a long period of time, um, depending on the mood of that, per however that person is interacting, but if it's, it, it could throw me off, right? Uh, it could cause a reaction. So um, not a major thing, but something in me stirs, right? And I, that's feeling, for me, that's what's uncomfortable. Like, it's not like I would need to say something to that person, but with that, that in that irritation or whatever comes up for me at that point in time. And if I can talk, I can talk to the person over the phone. I can talk to the person, you know, via FaceTime or whatever. That's fine. You know what I mean? But it's not somebody that I want to have a relationship with in terms of like an intimate kind of, and I love the person, but I don't want to necessarily be around that person. Um, and if something should happen that would that my presence would be needed, I would be there. You know. I would still say, Michelle, that because we, you know, Eckhart in that uh, look at his uh, talk on his website called "Dealing with Unconsciousness." Uh, I I don't think I can send send you the link. We've watched it uh, during group meditation, but I would still say that because the reactivity is still there in me, like if it happened to me, right? That I had reactivity um, within me, I would work on me. I would still work on me. I would go, why is there reactivity in me? What is it in me? Um, were like you the there story of you, the monk? You were, you were not there when Terry worked with Patricia, right? This is beautiful. So Terry, uh, on Sunday, when we were having group mm -hmm. meditation, uh, Terry, Patricia, Jonathan, and George stayed back. Like we, we talked for a little bit longer and probably a lot longer. Terry was walking Patricia through something because Eckhart says, right? And I read that piece to uh, Patricia because Patricia was taking something that Eckhart said, that, oh, we should never go in the past. The past is a bottomless pit. But right before that, Eckhart says, the circumstances of the present moment are showing you your past. And what about the circumstances? My reactivity of this present moment is showing me my past, is showing my, me my karmic accumulation that I need to, need to, my soul needs to learn how to, not be reactive with that situation to be so at then, peace to so, be at complete peace uh at, with that situation right be be that peace that passes all understanding and that situation is happening and how do you you know uh dr joe says look at your behavior what are you how are you going to behave that is the mental rehearsal how are you going to behave when the same thing happens now, but you're going to be your new self? You're going to be your unlimited genius. You're going to be empowered. You're going to be fearless. You're going to be um, in gratitude. You're going to be your div divinity. You, you're going to be divine. How does the divine react? Does this divine say that this person is uh, whatever trauma, they're talking about their trauma again, or whatever is going on, whatever, like, Let's say it's me and I call you, uh, Michelle, and I go, oh, my God, you know, this person is not acting really well. And I'm having problems with this, this thing. And I'm having problems with this. It's been happening for 20 years. It's been happening for 30 years. If I, if I call you and talk to you, are you going to be reactive? And if it's reactive, then what about what I'm saying? Are you going to be reactive? And that needs to be something that we need to heal within ourselves. That is what Dr. Joe is talking about, the new self. Who are you as, who are you going to be rehearsed like an actor? Who you're going to be in the future? Because the future me is not going to react no matter who it is, 
no matter how unconscious the government is, that's why you all don't see me responding to anything political. No matter who's responding, there's no, no reactivity. That's when, that's called nishkarma. The word is nishkarma. That's been no karma. That's when we don't create polarity because you're still creating polarity. Because there's that negative charge to it. There's a little negative charge to it. Does that make sense? And that's why Rob and I were saying, when we feel this oneness, right? There is no negative charge towards the other. What do you say, April? She's smiling. She has some wisdom coming through. So that this is where when I said um, in the beginning, it was difficult for me to do this and to maintain that space. So when I would leave, I would remind myself, this is not me, this is them. Uh, there is a huge thing that I have, I usually have to work with with people in my job. And it's um, basically, you have to learn to quit taking on other people's garbage. It's their garbage. It's not yours. And because we are kind people, we are empathetic, you know, we're caring, we take on other people's stuff, but it's not ours. And um, that story starts inside of us. And that's where the problem really, really comes in. So you, and Eckhart's really good at teaching this. He's really good at teaching like, I actually love the concept of the pain body because it's relatable. It's very relatable. Everybody has a pain. You can, when he says pain body, you, it's kind of like this light bulb goes off and you're like, yes, there is this thing inside of me that's full of pain. And if you really grasp that concept, then not only can you see it in yourself, but you can see it in others. And then you realize that's their pain body. It's not yours. Why are you taking it on? So you do separate yourself from it. Because he tries to engage me and pull me into whatever. But if drama you maintain, wants, so. right. But if you maintain, so there's still an irritation there that you haven't resolved. So I pull back and in a very calm manner, it's like trying to have him understand. I don't want to go there anymore. Um, He's not going to understand. That's your, your there's that's a, the there's thing, a right? little switch that you're missing. There's a little switch. Yeah. So you understand that to him, this is important because this is his pain body. He's trying to resolve. He's still trying to resolve that pain body. So he's bringing it up and bringing it up. They're reliving the past, reliving the past. They're not solving it, but they're reliving it because it is their pain body. That is their point. That is their, that is the problem, but they're stuck in the problem. But if you are conscious, you are aware, you're able to notice, oh, they're stuck in their problem. Yes. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Uh-huh. Yep. I sure do. No, but he's trying so, to make me do something he wants me to do to satisfy his there, pain body. And I don't want there. to do what he wants me to do. So, yeah. Hence, so there's irritation still in, in your energy field. There's still irritation with it. You still have some irritation with this. You have some resistance. When you drop the resistance and you know there, you go there knowing that his pain body is going to want you to do certain things. You already know that. Okay. He wants you to do certain things. You're not going to do it. You don't have to get upset. You don't have to be upset. Now, That's if it's a very fo forceful person, then perhaps you don't speak to them. I just limit, right, the conversations because I don't want to be drawn into. 
if you his, can't yeah if you can't reach the space that we're talking about then you just limit it um and if perhaps they are a very forceful person maybe mm -hmm. you limit it so there when you start to realize that other people's problems are not your problems that is that is his world that is his problem his world his view it is not yours and i made it that really clear is. right i made that clear in a very calm manner but he kept he keeps insisting so once through text or whatever i just i mean this was something that happened a while a few months ago so i just kind of like stay quiet you know so that i don't so he understands that it's not something i already said this is not something i want to get into and then i leave it alone because there's nothing else to say about it he knows how where i stand right and and he he's trying to draw me in to support whatever he wants to do and i'm not in agreement so it's that high quality no right it's where i'm not getting angry at you but i i want to keep some distance because i don't want to be opening the door to continue um okay manipulation i don't want to get into the details of it because it's not you know it's not something i want to get into but it it's a manipulation and i don't want to be part of it right i don't want to be pressured to do something that i don't feel comfortable doing so how, how mature is the relationship how i'm sorry how mature? I mean, how long has the relationship been going on? Oh no, it's a lifetime. It's a sibling. <laughs> <laughs> a lifetime, huh? The sibling, yeah. It's a now, sibling. Well, you know, what Eckerd talked about when you said pain body, but pain bodies merge in relationships, you know, but I don't know where we I don't know how the how would you go about like what you're talking about, like what April was saying. I didn't understand. Well, I don't want to change the subject. But, mm -hmm. but based on what April was saying earlier about her dad being wounded, um, just so we can clear that up, did, did you mean that it, he was wounded beyond repair and then you just set up a boundary that you didn't want to pursue it? My, um, so my father uh, came from a very abusive home as a child and then went into the Marines. And then my grandmother was murdered. Mm. Then my brother committed suicide. My father's wounded. And he may be so wounded in this lifetime that he's not able to heal. I get that. I understand that. And I'm okay with that. He does not have to heal. He does not have to heal for me to be okay. And then basically, and, and you're sort of like, you know, telling Michelle the same thing that, that that's where she should take a look at maybe standing that way. You love them where they're at. That's my, that's their level of consciousness. And in this lifetime, Theo, honey, we can't play. And this <laughs> time, this lifetime, he's met his threshold. There has been too much damage done to this person, this soul. And this is where, this is his max. That's okay. He's going to have to come back. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to pick a different role next time. But I'm okay with that. I still love him. I still respect him. He's a great man. Lots of people, you know, he literally would give you the shirt off his back. However, there are these wounded parts that seep in to his close relationships. And I'm okay with that. And he, he will say things to me um, that it is the wounded part of him. So he'll say something like, um, I'm having a garage sale. And so if you want any of your grandparents things, you better come by. Oh, okay, dad, that sounds great. I hope that that garage sale goes well. I hope you have a great night. Don't care. Not bothered not going there that's his wounded part trying to drag that's manipulation right i am totally not bothered because i know that that's where he's at so it's really a total acceptance of the other person 
their space, their consciousness, their woundedness, their issues, and a total acceptance that that has nothing to do with Incredible, April. Thank you so much. I, I think that's the key, Michelle, that, uh, you know, especially since uh, I've been doing, I've attended Dr. Joe's advanced retreat and for the past seven months, offering unconditional love, right? Week after week, three, four times a week, it happens. We have to get to that unconditional love. That's our lesson. Our lessons here are forgiveness, surrender, gratitude, ultimately unconditional love. And what April said, unconditionally, like you be as unconscious as you can be. I'll do my high quality no. You, you say your whole story all over again, right? It may be the same re repeated story, right? It may be the same patterns in the story, right? Like day one, there's a pattern to a story. Day two, it's almost a similar pattern, but a different version. Day three, there's a same pattern, same uh, similar story, right? But you offer your presence. You allow it to go through, like be transparent, let go through, let it pass through you, whatever that story is. And when they say, no, Michelle, I think you need to do this, this thing to this person, or you need to do that to that person, or you need to do that to that person. You just say, high quality, no, I'm so sorry. I mean, out of my spiritual practice, that does not sound the right thing to do. I will not do it that way. That's it. Very sweetly. I love you very much, but I'm so sorry. I, I cannot do it that way. Done. Story done. If they keep insisting, no, you have to do it this way. You have to, you have to, you have to. I'm a, thank you. I love you. I, I think we, can, we are at the point. I've done this to Parker. Parker, you're you're not in this in in the right now, the state in which you are. I cannot speak to you. We, we can talk when you are in more presence, right? And I put the phone down. It's not like hanging up. It's like, I love you very much, but you're not in presence. Your pain body is coming through. If your pain body is going coming through, we have to disconnect, right? High quality, no. Yeah, next day you call, I'll talk to you as much, two hours, three hours, I'll talk to you. But right now your pain body is coming through. Right. So we can so make yourself like learn how to bring yourself to them, like and actually offer that unconditional love. Like center of the magnet. Be uh, relaxed in the heart, awake in the brain, as Dr. Joe says, right? One heart, one mind. But we have to get into our heart and open our heart up because that's what. If we don't do it in this lifetime, we'd come back in so many more lifetimes to learn that we have to be relaxed in our heart. Because this relation, that, 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 that's your greatest spiritual teacher. He is your greatest spiritual teacher because he's showing you that there's something else that needs to be worked on. Yeah, you, you've come, you've done an incredibly amazing job. You worked through so much spiritual practice, but Still, there's some little thing that needs to be worked on, little tweak that needs to be made. Just make that tweak. And you will realize, you, you, won't, you won't believe it, how liberating, what freedom you're going to feel when you're able to face that circumstance over and over and over again, but be at peace, be at that unconditional love. I'm telling you, it's it, it's going to feel incredibly amazing when you are at that unconditional love. It doesn't matter. The past doesn't matter. My uh, my uh, mom cut us off from my uh, father's family, right? So my 
father's sister uh, tried to contact my brother and contact me as well. We never said you, I mean, they, they, my father left us to be with his family, right? So I've never said, I've never said, oh, you, my father abandoned us because of all of you. No, that this unconditional love. What happened in the past doesn't matter. And what, what they're saying, being stuck in the past, their pain body, their pain body is trying to do the feeding, right? We realize that, oh, the pain body is coming. Pain body is coming. It's okay. I'll give my presence. I'll stay in presence. Okay. Now it's getting to the point that they're not listening. Then, okay, I'll talk to you some other time. Right now, you you don't seem to be in a position where you're understanding. And Michelle, you need to do this. Oh, no. No. It doesn't feel right to me spiritually. It's not a compassionate choice. I, I don't think I can make, it's not, it doesn't sound loving and kind to me. It doesn't sound compassionate to me. So I don't want to make this choice. That's all you need to say, right? Like Eckhart said in that video, uh, Ruben's uh, report, he said, just say high quality no. If somebody's asking you for a loan, you already have loaned them $20,000 and they're asking for another $5,000, just say no. No, sorry, I don't want to give you the loan right now. Just like the guy that was yelling at him and Eckhart was looking at smiling at that guy, right? Eckhart knew that he he made a mistake, but he was okay with making that mistake. Let me, uh, you have something else to say, Michelle? Thank you, everybody. No, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for your input and April and everybody. It's helpful. You're most welcome. Rob, you want to add on something? And then I'll move to everybody else. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. The first thing that comes to my mind is um, <clears throat> this, I, I call it resurrection thing, This the, the power of now. We always have now to start over. Now, 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 now. We always have the now to align with this piece and at that moment that we feel triggered uh the something is stirring some the 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 world is reflecting back to us some type of negative energy that's inside of me i have that moment to start over again and i think as children we're raised to for the majority of us the world seems to think that if we don't feel bad with them, which actually means if we're not vibrating on the same low frequency that they're on, we're taught that that's wrong. We're, we're, you know, parents say, I feel terrible about this. You should feel terrible that you did this. And we learn at a young age that we should vibrate at this lower frequency. And so when someone else is in our space, in our physical space, and we're becoming triggered, it's because we want naturally innately want to be at peace. But we've been taught, no, this person's suffering. We need to vibrate on their suffering level. And uh, you brought up, you mentioned Abraham Hicks uh, a, a little bit ago and she says, you can't get poor enough to help poor people. You can't get sick enough to help sick people. And basically, we can't vibrate low enough to help people that are vibrating low. We, and that's keeping that presence power, staying in the now, starting over and over. We see the trigger and then we say, oh, okay, no, I can stay at peace. And the person that we're speaking to doesn't understand that at all. Or maybe they're at a level of consciousness where their their light is starting to shine and, and they can start to open up to that. But mostly that's a huge roadblock. And when we stay at peace and another person isn't accepting of that, that's that almost hurts as a human being because I've been conditioned my whole life to get on that lower frequency vibrating uh, level with the, with the rest of the suffering people. And that's where the inner conflict happens with myself uh, in the past. Um, 
I still get triggered. Um, I have a long way to go, but um, I'm doing much better than I used to be. So I think that is my view on that whole scenario. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rob, for sharing that. I thought of something and then that thought just slipped my mind. What was the start that you said, Rob? Can you remind me? Thank you. What are you asking? What What did you say in the beginning? Oh, resurrection. I use the word resurrection okay. starting over and over and over. Does that help your No, you memory? said something really, really important call. after that. Now I cannot remember what it was. Um, um, I, I like to start over over and over and over the, the moment of now alignment, keep to my peaceful center. Um, people get, I get triggered or I can get triggered and that's reflecting back to me uh, what someone else is um, or what is inside of me that I need to work on. It's not work on the outer world, it's work on the inner me. Okay. Low frequency maybe. I really <laughs> no, I, that part is just escaped me. I'll, I'll remember it. Thank you so much, Rob. Grateful You're for welcome. the input. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, what do you think of what advice April and I gave Michelle? Um, I, I definitely see when I look back at the the interaction that I always notice my state of being. And so when I'm not equanimous, I feel it right away. Um, and I see the subtle difference of what you're saying. I can understand that. Um, I know in my heart that I offer him love and wish him blessings in all aspects of his life. And I even say that in my prayers. I just want space. Um, I, I don't want to have a... So uh, w uh, one more thing that I just got reminded of was, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, Eckhart in his talk on um, you are the sky, you can watch this talk and you realize, he says, um, when we focus on another's flaw, right? As a judgment, when we focus on another's flaw, the flaw just magnifies, right? It's like, uh, it amplifies, the flaw amplifies. So that person is not doing what they're doing because of uh, that they are that condition pattern. It's also our, our thinking. Like the moment this person calls, you're going to go, oh, he's going to go into his story again, right? He or she is going to go into their story again. Again, they call or text, oh, they're going to now start that same old uh, traumatic, whatever part one of that was, they're going to go into that trauma again. Third time they call, oh, they're going to go. So look at our inner um, thing, right? That we are already setting that intention. Our personality is co-creating that personal reality. So we are almost co-creator with them. And there's a quantum entanglement with that person. You're entangled with that person because of that emotion that you have created for that person that they call and this emotion is created, right? That it, it, you're not, you know, you're not equanimous, right? There's some kind of flutter, whatever emotion. So what Dr. Joe says, what takes something that needs to cut that, you know, you may say I'm, I'm separated from you. 
I'm not going to talk to you or this thing, but you're still entangled in the quantum field with that person. The only way to separate is you need to become a faster frequency. The, the vibrational frequency needs to be raised. Exactly what April and I were saying, that your vibrational energy is, needs to be so high that that emotion no longer exists between you and that other person. And one way of doing that is to do the mental rehearsals. Where what you're um, doing is, is actually, um, uh, you would look like, let's say um, uh, it's a son that's, uh, or it, let's say it's a son or daughter that's uh, uh, addicted to alcohol, like Brian Katie's daughter was, like Brian Katie's daughter was alcoholic. So if the daughter is alcoholic, you would imagine her not being an alcoholic. So you would imagine her going and so you would imagine him um, actually having a beautiful time. That's the mind movie you need to play. The mental rehearsal that you need to do in your mind is seeing this person in a beautiful relationship, seeing this person um, having a really good time, uh, like having healthy relationships with other people, having joyful relationships with other people, having um, like having laughs, like sitting around a dinner table, you know, that's the mental rehearsal that you would do. So then that puts you into seeing that person differently than every time they pick up the phone or FaceTime them, you're gonna go, oh, he's gonna go into that same old story. Now here comes the story, right? So I know this because my mom, the moment I would pick up the phone, I would talk to her a little bit and then she would go, oh, I have a high blood pressure, I have this, I have my back pain, I have this thing. There would be a laundry list day two, same thing. I have high blood pressure, I have back pain, I have this. There'd be a laundry list of things that she has issues with. But I knew the moment I would talk, and she actually, I started to talk to her about Eckhart's uh, work and that it's your thoughts that are creating this thing. And she would she would tell my uh, brother, so there's a word called traversion, which is a spiritual talk. <laughs> she said that every time Pudam calls me, she gives traversions, she gives spiritual talks to me. <laughs> she told my brother that. So uh, what I would say is do that mental rehearsal. One, break the bond, you know, break the bond, becoming a faster frequency, right? That's the only way to break the, like two atoms to break them apart, like uh, to neutrons and protons. It requires a hadron collider and lots of energy. So we have to become a faster frequency. I would say back to the meditation, the two hours of meditation, make sure you do your meditations. But then uh, the second thing is, is, mental rehearsal, see them different than what they are. See them different than who they are. Like see them as, uh, like, a, like I was saying, alcoholic daughter, then see them that, oh, she's going to college. She's got a fantastic job. She's married. She has uh, kids. She's taking care of her kids. Like you would watch, make the mental movie of that person totally different than what they're present now is you would put them as, as a future self right uh, make a future him so then you break that bond they uh, some of the bond will break and you will realize michelle that this frequency as you change it your relationship with them will change automatically and leave alone the relationship will change something about them will change and you won't even know why it changed right? It'll be mysterious. But all you, all we did was change our own energy. I told, I told you during group meditation, right? I used to have an issue with my uh, coworker. I worked on my frequency. They left. Uh, one, we, our work situation changed where I just had to go to work two days a week. Then Christmas came. Mm -hmm. Within a few months, that person left. Like the universe takes automatically takes that person out of our um, life, right? Let me go to Patricia and mm -hmm. see what she has to say. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Patricia. 
Mm, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm sure all of us situation <laughs> many times still are because when you are talking people, but my experience is exactly what April and Punam was talking about is if I just try to from the same level, even observing it and knowing I'm going to send the boundaries. I don't want to do this. You know, I'm protecting something that didn't work. It's like I was that entanglement was still there, even though I was late. I was enlightened because I saw how wrong they were trying to do something that I didn't want and I needed to set the boundaries. And at that point, I knew it's like, I can't change them. I just want to protect me from, but it was still within the same level, within the same platform. So I would completely imagine a different scenario. And I did send love. That was a change in the beginning because normally you would say, oh, they're bad, they're this, how dare they, blah, blah, blah. Then the love comes and then forgiveness and the compassion, but it's still, again, working. It's like changing the energy maybe a little bit, but it's still working on the same level. And then just flipping completely and changing. I don't know how that happened. I think it was pure grace that I just, I just wondered. That doesn't work. I suck. I'm unhappy. I noticed this. And what to do? What do I do, God? And something, something changed. And, um, uh, with siblings, yeah, that stuff. I still, I still have certain situation with my brother, and um, I said my piece, and I see him as a good person. But still, there's some triggers. There's leftover stuff, and this is their role. Like Punam said, this is the teacher in them in that situation. Because as long as you still feel a need to set the boundaries there is still something that the universe is telling you it's in you to work on so that lesson will keep coming that's at least how it happens to me and that being said I do have another quick question for April because on the same topic is that we know about the parents, we talked about the fathers, the mother, the parents. So we have to understand, forgive and stuff. We do that. We also have siblings, right? When we are engaged and the same platform, but I still have now with my daughter. So in other words, it's hardest for me. I can understand that maybe it's, not the lifetime for my father to heal or my mother to feel that they're in their parent bodies. It's not going to happen this lifetime. My brother, okay, you know, he's his own person, but I still feel like I can help my daughter. It's like, have the role because I'm the mother to show her, look at me. I did it. You can do it too. And it's just, that is the part that I can't let go yet. I, it's still coming through like, I know this. I'm a little longer on this earth. I have the lessons. I did the, the work. Listen to me. I see you suffering. Just listen to me kind of thing. So in a sense, I gave up, <laughs> uh, you know, for, for what is it? Uh, it's uh, offspring and forspring, whatever it's saying. Uh, yeah. On that, on siblings, but my kid, yeah, she's coming home tomorrow. And um, what do I do to not have it bother me? Not have it feel like I need to do something still. So. Yeah. 
Um, so it's really hard when it's with kids. It is really hard. And um, I, so I think it's kind of twofold. You know, there is a part where you were given this child to guide um, and source creation knew that you were going to be the parent and knew what kind of guide you were going to be. And in a sense, there's, there's like a little bit of, you know, I was given this human to mold. Um, and then there's, there's another side though. So I don't know if that ever fully goes away. I mean, I'm sure some people can get rid of that. Um, but being a parent, I don't know that that fully ever goes away that you just you know, um, cut it off and don't have any attachments at all. Um, but I can tell you that what I have learned is, um, I was trying to think of what kid it happened with. Um, I can't remember which one of my kids out of the five, six that it happened, but there was a day where you know, I was, I was trying to um, teach them and I want them to be well and I want them to not suffer and I want them to be happy. And if you would just listen to me, I could save you years of torment. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <clears throat> um, and then it just kind of hit me one day and, and I really, it really kind of floored me. Um, it's not my kid. They're not mine. They are sources. They are source energy. I was put here to be the guide. They're not mine. And that brought me to my knees one day. They are their own soul. They are on their own journey. Am I saying to not help them? No. But we also have to step back and realize that they have their own journey and that if we save them from everything, where's the journey? Where's the journey? What are they going to learn? Plus, I, I think that we also add to their plight by being our unconscious selves, right? As parents, and maybe mm -hmm. repeating our parents' karma. Absolutely. We, still we don't add to their, their plate. plate. No. no. Well, we add to their plate, yes, in one sense. But we also don't add to their plate because, again, before you come here, you pick who your parents are going to be. You pick your lifetime. You pick your experiences. You pick your parents, your country, male or female. You decide when female is pregnant and there is to be a person being born a soul takes on that job okay i'll do that i can do that family that family will work out for me <laughs> i love the way you say it. it's just so awesome it's like, yeah it's sci-fi it's sci-fi sci right well you know what there's other beliefs and stuff out there but this is the one that i really have found that it resonates, it fits, it makes sense. Um, and how, how else would you, again, source is always about expansion. It always is about growth and expansion. How else to expand than to have a life here on earth? So part of you, yes, you help your child. Yes, you guide them, but they're not yours. We think they're ours. We think they're going to be with us forever. And all of a sudden they become teenagers and this world allows them to drive at 16 and they don't want anything to do with us. But it, ultimately they are their own soul. So you also have to realize that um, everybody learns at their own pace. So basically when your daughter has suffered enough, she will awaken. Now, some people are like my dad and my mother was the same way. 
they just had so much stuff happen to them that they were not able to awaken. My dad's aware of psychic ability. He's aware of that. He's a very intelligent man. He's aware of energy. But as far as being able to embrace it with himself, he's not capable. So you have to stand back too and know that they have to have their own suffering. And remember when I told you that my fourth daughter, sometimes I've had to ask the universe to stop using her to teach me. Theo, please. He is going crazy. Um, she was having an extremely, extremely rough time, um, which happens with her. And I was trying to console her and love her and joke with her and, hey, let's get out of bed and let's do this and that. And she wouldn't do it. She would not do it. Theo, stop. Oh my gosh. Um, and that is the moment when I realized that you can't actually love somebody else. I can have love for her, but I can't actually love her unless she lets me. You can't actually help somebody else unless they let you. Is that giving and receiving to get right? She There's didn't no want love at that moment. Receiving, right. I gave her love, but she didn't want it at that time. She did not want it. So therefore, I tried giving it to her all day. She did not want it. If they do not want help, you cannot help them. And how? where do you put it? How do you make it okay inside that my own child doesn't want my help? no matter what I do well right it's not about you right and I get the Patricia I get the exact same feelings I am a mom I am a human there's times where I have the exact same feelings and I'm like I can help the whole world but I can't help my own dang kid right so I have those same feelings um but there's always this space in the background this space that you got to connect with that uh, they are their own soul and that source has them source has their back ultimately and their journey is perfect just like your journey is perfect now if it takes them till they're 50 then okay it takes them till they're 50 we don't like that we don't want that but there you got to have that faith again it's the same thing like um you know, you're perfectly exactly where you're at on this journey, that there's, you know, source has everything is all taken care of. So just trust and, that if I work on what's coming up for me and those, those little nudges, like what Michelle is still experiencing with certain things, if I work on this and heal that, maybe it will also, yeah. yeah. And, and something will be like a karmatic thing will be t taken off my daughter's plate right since i'm no so you're thinking no mm -mm. she's got to resolve her own karma we do cause issues in our children's lives because we're human but you have to know that you know you can speak to them about it and you can say hey you know I really wasn't in a good space when I made this choice. And I've even told my children, you know what? I was young. Um, and then I, there's some things I'll see my children do. And I'll say, you really shouldn't do that. And they'll be like, well, my mom did it. And I'll say, well, just because your mom did it doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> I, I, how old was I? I had my first child at 16 years old. You know, um, it's a journey. It's a learning journey. It's acceptance. So you're not taking karma off of her plate. That's not your job to do. That's her job to do. Only she can resolve her own karma. So I must have. You're I not must... causing her karma. You're not causing her karma. So I must have misunderstood um, one of the teachings that I heard from Thik Nhat Hanh that once we are present and we heal us, we also heal our ancestors and we heal up whoever 
generations are before us. Right. That is true. But the way that you're thinking of it is I did these things. I made these mistakes. So now I have to clear up her karma. No, but yes, when we do heal ourselves, we do heal our past and our present and our future. So it's, it is physically healing. It's not specific events, right? It's just. Yeah, you can go into specific events. Like I um, was meeting with, uh, uh, it's a Zainen Qigong teacher. It's a different type of Qigong teacher. And uh, out of the blue, she looked at me and said, um, do you have a history? Is your family German? And I was like, yeah. And there's that whole German thread of, you know, there's a lot of karma with that history. So that is something that I could go into different spaces and timelines and I could work on healing that. However, you got to tweak the way you're looking at that a little bit. So as you heal yourself, it will heal your past, your present and your future, but it's not to save your daughter necessarily or to correct anything that you perhaps did in her lifetime. But the more that you heal, the more that um, eventually they catch on. I have my daughter will post things, different ones. One posted something the other day on Facebook and it was basically about um, not letting your mind control you. And I commented yes on there. And then she wrote back, you know, this is because of you. Well, she's going to be 35. It's taken 35 years. So, yeah. She's younger than, yeah, some of us. Yep. So. Theo, you are driving me crazy. Come here. Is your cat? Yes. <laughs> he wants out. So come here, Theo. Um, so, I mean, I hopefully, I don't, I don't want you to have guilt, Patricia, is what it is, for the things that perhaps we did wrong raising our kids. That's not going to help you or her. Basically is what I'm trying to say to you. Okay, no guilt. <laughs> you were where you were at the time. That's where you were. Thank you so much, April. That was incredible. Yeah. Grateful for the guidance. Uh, what I would say, Patricia, is uh, listen to chapter four of A New Earth, roles, playing roles, and the role of a mother. Learn, to, you are still trying to you're still deriving a sense of self-esteem from your daughter and how well your daughter is going to do because you want her to you have this urgent desire that she should do well she should not fall sick she should do well she should be well you're still deriving your sense of self from her and that you you have to like get a sense of uh, space between her and you and realize that already for, if she's 19, 20 years old, for 20 years, already unconsciousness between whatever relationships happen between you and her father, that pain body is in her. That pain body will come back. It'll come attack you, right? The same thing, I mean, what April and I told Michelle, it like, you can paintbrush that and apply it to your your relationship with your daughter as well. Because that pain body, the same thing that April told Michelle about the pain body, that pain body is looking to feed at something and it's going to snap at you, right? And you're going to go, uh, if you're so identified with your mother role, you're going to go, I'm the mother. How can you do this to me? You're not supposed, you're supposed to listen to me. No. She's her, just like April said, she's her own soul. And now she's 19, 20, she's beyond adult, right? So uh, Eckhart says, by the time you, uh, like below 12, your children are people that need guidance, right? You can, uh, I mean, people that you need to say, stop touching that because they'll touch fire or they'll harm themselves, right? But he says, by the time they're 12, you become a guide to them. Just like what April said. Now you just provide guidance. Okay, next step, next step, provide guidance. 
let them make their own mistakes. They will have their own journey. And what the main thing Eckhart says, right? Not your words, nothing that you say to her is going to make a difference. The amount of presence power that you have, your presence needs to teach. How present you are with her, you, how, how much you don't get drawn, exactly what we told Michelle, right? How much you don't get drawn into whatever she, she's going to attack, right? She's going to say, oh, mom, you were never, a, a, my, my son says, you were not a good mom. You were not, I mean, that boy was loved unconditionally. He, he'd suddenly say, you were not a good mom. You didn't do this for me, or you didn't do that. That's okay. We did the best, what April said, we did the best we could at the level of consciousness that we were at that time. Now we are more conscious. So we're going to be more conscious right now. And then um, whatever the chapter is about this, this shall to pass and the baby, the monk that uh, had the baby, you know, the Zen monk that got the baby and said, is that so? So you're going to do the, is that so with your daughter? She's going to say, no, I, I don't want to, I'm going to fall sick 200 times a year. Is that so? Is that so? Is that so? That is what it is. She wants to fall sick. She likes the attention of the doctor. You know, that's another way of seeking approval. If you watch some of Eckhart's videos, you'll see that their attention from the doctor is, is their satisfaction. She's getting the satisfaction of, oh, somebody, somebody else is loving me. When they fall sick, right? The boyfriend is still loving me. Maybe the boyfriend is much more kinder. You have to go, many blessings, April. So grateful, so grateful. Eternally Thank grateful you so to you for all your guidance. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. So uh, let go of the role, right? And detachment, the, this, this shall, this too shall pass, or maybe, or is that so? the guy who said maybe, right? His son fell off the horse, and then he said maybe, that whole story. But that I'll go to Hugh. Hugh, did you want to say something, Hugh, and wrap this up? The only thing I can tell you about family it's like they I've seen it a thousand times. Everybody holds each other to the highest standard. <laughs> you know, I've watched my uh, brother get reamed out by customer service and saying, I'm sorry, man, sorry, I don't I didn't mean to do this. Well, no, you're no good, and, and kept going at him and going at him. And that's fine, right? Me and him get out on a job, and I just walk up, didn't say one word. <laughs> What's that look for? And then he attacks. I mean, you know, it's just like everybody's like all amped up. They don't even take words with family. You know what I mean? Where with a perfect stranger, you can take it all. And it's sort of like being outside looking in, you know? It's okay to have a plan and practice mindfulness and do everything until you get punched in the face with your own stuff. And then the triggers come and it's hard. And that's what I'm... I've been working with for the last year with my elderly parent, you know, and um, I'm getting really good at it, getting punched in the face and not reacting, you know? So that's my two cents. <laughs> that's the lesson we are here to learn. They are our greatest spiritual teachers, all the unconscious human beings and the most is uh, the more shared past we have, right? The more presence we, that we need. I think Eckhart says something along those lines. The more shared past we have with someone, the more presence we need to develop. And one more thing. Hey, Rob, that book is awesome, man. I got the first two chapters down. Your, um, your verbiage in that book is brilliant. Because oh. you, take, you take a... Um, you take like three or four different things. You just the way you are, it's really good. It's very effective. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I love it. Thank you. Awesome. You're, you're welcome. 
I hope everyone got something out of this uh, conversation. I know Michelle initiated the conversation, but it, it applied to Patricia. So I'm hoping everyone got something out of this conversation. Thank but, you. I just want you. to say that I also got the book by, um, oh my God. Shafali Sabri? Yes. Yeah, the, the, Shifali. The, myth, the myth of normal. Oh, Gabor Mate. Gabor Mate. Dr. Okay, yes. perfect. I, I didn't expect it to be so huge. It's like a, like a college book. It's so big. It's, Is that the one he wrote with his son that yes. he recommended? Okay. Yeah, yes, I did get, it's a big, okay, because I was thinking of getting it too. Okay. Yes, please. That's what I was going to say. It's. I just looked through the first chapters like, oh my gosh, that's, yes, that's for us, you and me, <laughs> especially. <laughs> I actually got the audio version, so I listened to it. Another was the one that uh, so great, grateful to another for recommending mm -hmm. it. She was very much into it. And so I listened to it audio, but within a few days, I finished it. Yeah, he awesome. goes he goes into all kinds of trauma since we uh, were talking about trauma. I mean, it's incredible what human beings and a lot of uh, he brings up examples of a lot of successful human beings that we come across. He gives their examples and what kind of trauma they have gone through. He completely like, describes it. So trauma is like a very painful pain body or trauma is pain body. Or trauma yeah. is just a more of a... trauma is an event that happened in your past like some kind of sexual abuse or rape or that would be trauma the trauma um pain or, body is caused by trauma is an it's a effect a pain body is uh more like when we had negative some of it could be during the trauma that we um develop a brain body but pain body can be like normal like leaving leading normal life and we are experiencing like physical abuse and then we are having this uh not processing our emotions whenever we don't process the negative emotion it becomes like it's stored that emotion is stored in our body and it's called the pain body but i thought that trauma is exactly and un that unprocessed very strong emotion no trauma is much more intense than just unprocessed emotion Trauma can be pretty debilitating. It can be me mental illness. It can cause psychological illness as well. So I guess I'm looking forward to reading it to actually figure out because my understanding of it might have been different or maybe people, uh, you know, talking that right now everybody has trauma. So in other words, even if you didn't have very, on the like a level of, you know, bad things happen to you, like, death in the family or very horrifying accidents or really you know like you said also rape and stuff like that but you just had a parent that yelled at you and you didn't understand so now they saying this is traumatic too because i think he calls it a little t that's not like a really traumatic event like if you just had physical abuse right he, I think he calls it, look, remember Terry, even Terry said not uh, everything is traumatic. When I said your divorce was traumatic, she said not everything is traumatic, but you have to be very careful about labeling something traumatic as being traumatic. That That is just like stuff happening to us. Sometimes stuff just happens to us. That's what she said during the Sunday meditation. Yeah, that's why I really wanted to read it because that, yeah, that's how I hear people saying those things like that. And maybe it's just their misuse vocabulary. Yes, let's let's meet again next week, and then we can discuss some more. I know everybody must be getting tired. Michelle and Patricia and the East Coast, and maybe Hughes too. So this thank was incredibly you. amazing. So thank you so much. Infinite gratitude that thank everyone was here. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Many blessings. Much Bye love. Friends. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. 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 Bye, Bye, Sri Lakshmi. Bye, Mish.